Okay, hi everybody. Is the microphone working enough? Yeah. Great. Okay, I'm Roger, and I'm going to try to teach you uh, a lot of different things about Tor for the evening. I figure I'll start with what is Tor and how does it work, and how many people here have some good idea of what Tor is and how it works already? I see some hands, but not very many. Okay, great. And then after that, I'm going to talk some about Tor Onion services, which you might know as the dark web. <laughs> after that, I'll talk about censorship and uh, China and Turkey and interesting uh, things like that. Okay, so Tor is, uh, you've just heard a lot about what Tor is. Tor is a nonprofit in the US. Tor is a network of volunteers running relays around the world. Tor is a set of open protocols. One of the fun things about Tor is every city that I go to has a university with people studying how to make Tor faster, how to make Tor safer, how to break Tor. So every university that I go to has somebody interested in writing Tor research papers. And there are some number of users. It's hard to tell how many users because it's a privacy anonymity system. But one of the estimates has about 2 million daily users, and a more recent estimate has about 8 million daily users. So there are a lot of different people using Tor at this point. And that means that the average Tor, the average Tor user is the average internet user. It's not like these are 8 million political dissidents. These are 8 million ordinary people who decided uh, they don't, I mean, they read another article about the NSA watching the internet, or they just learned that their government is doing something scary, so they want to do more safety on the internet. Okay, so when you're thinking about this from a security perspective, the first question is, what's your threat model? What do you expect the user to, to, the attacker to be able to do? So we've got some user over here, Alice, and she's trying to browse the web or connect to some destination bub, where can the attacker be? Maybe the attacker's watching Alice's local network. Maybe it's somebody watching the wireless in this room right now. Or maybe the attacker's on the bob side. Maybe they're, uh, they're watching WikiLeaks and they want to know who is connecting to WikiLeaks. Am I speaking too quickly? No, that's okay. So far so good? That fellow speaks English well. That doesn't mean that everybody else. Uh, let me know if I am speaking too quickly and I'll, I'll slow down. So, or the attacker could be on the Bob side, watching the website, trying to learn who's going to the website. Or the attacker could be in the middle of the internet, Deutsche Telekom, AT&T, NSA, something like that, trying to match up which users are connecting to which destination. And anonymity is not the same as encryption. Encryption is good, you should use encryption. But even when you're using encryption, somebody watching your connection gets to see who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how much you're talking to them. And that metadata is actually what intelligence agencies and, uh, and internet providers and so on use these days. Nobody actually tries to break the encryption. It's all about, let's build a, a social graph of who's talking to who and find out who's in the middle of that graph and then break into their house and install something on their laptop. So hopefully you've seen creepy American NSA guy and his phrase, we kill people based on metadata. This was a phrase from, I don't know, five or 10 years ago now, but it's still true. Uh, there are, all around the world, there are militaries and intelligence agencies who are trying to figure out who is interesting on the internet. And sometimes they just collect information about them, sometimes they send a drone to kill them. So I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to other researchers. When I'm talking to my parents and relatives, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system. I, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system. I, I provide privacy. Anonymity, it's a bit scary, but privacy is a good you know, Western value. The Eastern value, it's a, it's a thing that everybody should be able to get behind. And when I'm talking to companies, I work on communication security because, well, companies don't care about privacy. The Oracle guy already said that. And certainly companies are scared of anonymity. But do I want to be able to investigate websites like competitor websites without having them learn that I'm looking at them? Do I want to be able to buy things on the internet without somebody watching me learning what I'm thinking about buying? I learned recently that Goldman Sachs uses Tor uh, throughout their network because if you're thinking about investing in a new stock, somebody watching your internet connection gets to learn everything all of your analysts are investigating. So this is a sort of metadata 
that you might want to protect. And when I'm talking to governments, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And again, it's all the same system, it's the same security properties, but it's a very different way of looking at it for them. Because if you go to the government and you say, I have a privacy tool, they say, we don't need privacy. And if you say, I have an anonymity tool, they say, oh, I'm scared of anonymity. And if you say, I have a security tool, they say, oh, we have enough of those. So we provide traffic analysis resistant communication. And that's something that, that no other tool can provide. And then there's the fourth category, which is the reachability to people who are trying to get to BBC and can't. And so they install something like Tor in order to get around uh, government or local censorship. So the goal of Tor is to take all of these different users and put them into the same network so that they can blend together. You can't have a network only for Chinese dissidents. Otherwise, anybody who installs it will be identifying why they're using it. So you need to have a bunch of different kinds of uses so that the average user is, is, a, is an ordinary person. It's pretty boring. So how do you actually build one of these? The easy answer is a VPN type design, a central proxy. So all the users ask a question to the central proxy, and it goes and gets the answer. And this is how a lot of VPNs work. This is how uh, a bunch of commercial companies work. And so the first problem is, what happens when that central point of failure fails? So they, they promise they won't reveal your data, but actually they have all of it, and you don't, you don't get to learn whether they're going to do it. I was actually talking to a uh, CTO of one of these companies long ago, one of these VPN companies, and he said, we never answer subpoenas. If, if governments came to us and they asked questions and we answered, nobody would ever, would ever trust us ever again. So of course we never answer when the government asks us questions. And then I was doing a talk for the US Department of Justice a couple of months after that, and they raised their hand and said, why can't you be like anonymizer.com? It's easy, we send them a request, they send us an answer, why can't you be like that? And I say this not to pick on a particular company, the problem is the business model, the problem is the architecture, the problem is the centralization where they have all of your data, they know who you are and they know what you do, and they could screw you, and they promise not to. That is a terrible situation. You want a, a situation where the architecture of the system you're using makes it so that no single point gets to learn both who you are and what you're doing. So it's actually worse than this in the VPN case. Even if your VPN is somehow magically perfect, totally honest, they don't sell your data, they don't go bankrupt and get bought by somebody else who then starts selling your data, even in that case, it's still a centralized system where all the traffic goes into the same VPN provider and then all the traffic comes out again. And if I can look at all the flows coming in and match them up with all the flows going out by timing and volume, then I start noticing patterns. And then I say, that user went to that website. That user went to that website. So the centralization of the, of the architecture uh, is a problem even if the company itself is magically perfect, which they never are. So the goal of Tor is to distribute the trust over multiple relays so that no single point gets to learn both who you are and what you're doing on the internet. And that means that several different uh, points in the Tor network need to get together and share information in order to be able to attack you. So far so good? Yes. Great. So that was actually only the first half of what Tor is. That was the network level privacy. There's also application level privacy. So we started off in Tor saying, uh, here's the program called Tor. Here's how you can configure your browser to send traffic over Tor. And then we started realizing that browsers have all these application level problems, like cookies and Flash and which fonts you have installed and how big your browser window is and what versions of extensions you have. Uh, and it all became a horrible mess at the application layer. And so the fix for that is what we call Tor Browser, which is based on Firefox. And we try to fix all of the privacy issues that Firefox has. The goal is not to make you blend in with the entire internet. The goal is to make all the Tor Browser users look the same. So that means that 8 million people are using Tor today, and you look like one of them. And it's hard to recognize you over time as you browse different websites. Another 
approach for using Tor, another way that people use Tor, is a live CD called Tails. It's based on Debian. You install it on your USB key. You put it on your laptop. You boot a separate operating system. And it has all the applications that you should want safely configured. And when you pull it out, everything shuts down and disappears. And there's no evidence left on your computer. So for example, when the journalists were looking at the Ed Snowden documents, they were using Tails in order to be as safe as they could be while using Tor, while using the internet, while sharing these interesting documents. And recently, finally, there is a Tor browser for Android, which is awesome. And this happened because uh, a year or so ago, there was finally a real Firefox for Android. And because Tor Browser is based on Firefox, we were able to make a, a real Tor Browser for Android. So there is still no Tor Browser for iOS, which is very sad. And the reason for that is there's no Firefox for iOS. And every time I say that, somebody holds up their phone and says, no, I have, I have Firefox on my, my iPhone. You don't. You have Safari with the word Firefox written over it. <laughs> There's only one browser that Apple allows on the iPhone, and it's WebKit or Safari or whatever they want to brand. And that's true for Chrome, it's true for Firefox. So that means that uh, if you want to be as safe as you can be, then we don't have a good answer for iPhone. And that's because of Apple's monopoly uh, corporate habits. <coughs> OK, so here's a graph of the, the load on the Tor network over the past uh, eight years or so. So the green line is the capacity of the network, and it's up to 400 gigabits per second. The purple line is the load on the network, the actual bytes that are being carried. And uh, you'll see that we're doing 200 gigabits per second, which is uh, a whole lot. It's like the size of Wikipedia at this point. But the other fun thing about this graph, as these two lines become farther apart, Tor becomes more fun to use. It used to be, back here, when they were really close together, the Tor was really slow, because you were waiting for somebody else's web page to load before your web page could load. And now, as we add more and more relays and they have more capacity, it's more likely that you'll get a fun, happier Tor experience. So how do you actually measure safety? How do you measure how, how well Tor is doing at this sort of thing. One answer is the diversity of where the relays are. So imagine we put all the relays at Harvard and MIT. In that case, it's pretty easy to watch the entire Tor network because you just watch the internet connections for those two universities. So as we add more relays in different places, it becomes harder and harder for the attacker to be in enough different places to watch traffic to match it up. So that's one notion, diversity of where the relays are. But the other notion is diversity of types of users, diversity of why people are using it. And this is really important in countries like Iran, where we have tens of thousands of people using Tor, but the average Tor user in Iran is trying to get to their Facebook websites or trying to read their blogs about kittens or whatever people do on the internet that got censored in their country. And that's really important because that means that when you find a Tor user in Iran, you haven't found a political dissident. You found an ordinary person between the age of 20 and 40 who's trying to use the web like they used to be able to it before you censored it. So that, that normalness is really important to security. You need that cover traffic in order to, to be able to keep the actual, uh, the, the higher, more sensitive users safe. Okay, and another key point, transparency for Tor is really important. So yes, it's open source, we publish everything, we show you how it works, we give you a design document, we give you specifications, uh, and also we publicly identify ourselves. Hi, I'm Roger, I wrote Tor, I go around the world teaching people about Tor, and that transparency is really important for building trust. It's important for having a community of people who, uh, who are willing to learn more about Tor and run relays and participate and, and help other people learn about it. So hopefully, once you've learned about Tor tonight, you can go out and, and teach other people uh, about these things. And the, I, I hear from a lot of people, oh, ha, ha, the anonymity people are talking about transparency. They're so stupid. Uh, it's not a contradiction. Privacy is about choice. We choose to be transparent in order to make as safe a community as we can. So privacy is not about you hide everything always. Privacy is about you get to choose 
what you tell people. And yes, there are bad people on the internet, and some of them use Tor. So one answer to that is there are millions of daily users and not all that many bad people using Tor. So one of the challenges with a privacy system is that you don't see the other 8 million users. So if you're a law enforcement person and you see some bad person using Tor and you think privacy is stupid so there are only 12 users and you just saw one of them, then you think Tor is useless. So there's a lot of good, ordinary activity happening in the background that nobody, nobody sees because it's working, because it's a privacy system. Uh, another answer is, yes, it's a, it's a balance. There's, there's good uses and bad uses. You have to balance it. But the, the bad people have so many more options for how to be bad people on the internet. Uh, imagine you're, a, you're trying to be a terrorist on the internet. You want to build a system that works for the next two weeks, and you don't tell people about it, and it doesn't have to scale. So that's, there are so many little tricks you can use. You get in a flame war on Wikipedia, you, you, know, you hide something somewhere. As long as it doesn't have to uh, go through like, the transparency and the open scrutiny, and it doesn't have to scale, and it doesn't have to last, there are so many more ways that bad people can be safe on the internet. Whereas the Tor approach is, I want to build something that works for millions of people, I want it to work for years, and I want to tell you all about it so you can help me decide whether it's safe. So those are two very different uh, approaches. OK, so that was the how Tor works. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this thing called onion services. Uh, how many people here know the phrase onion services? A uh, couple of hands. How many people here know the phrase the dark web? <laughs> More hands. Okay. Uh, so it's the same thing, but the dark web is just a phrase made up by journalists to sell more magazines and to get you to click on advertisements. So here, the, the basic idea for onion services, everything I was talking about before was I want to go to a website and I want to, to safely go there. I want to make it so that you can't figure out that I'm the one going to this website. So that's sort of a, a forward anonymity idea. Now let's take that as a building block and glue two of those Tor circuits together so now I can talk to somebody else who's using Tor and I don't have to know where they are or who they are, but I can still reach them and I can get good security properties out of that. So the way this works in practice is you end up with a blah 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 dot onion address like that. And the blah 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 is the hash of the public key of the onion service. And that it's hard to remember, but it gives you really cool security properties. The most important really cool security property is that you, your Tor client knows for sure that you're talking to the Onion service that matches that address. Because while it's doing the handshake with the Onion service, it makes sure that the other side knows the private key that matches the public key that hashes to the address. And that means that Nobody can man in the middle of you. Nobody can send you to the wrong place. You have good authentication to know that you're actually talking to the right place. And this is really important because the alternative, HTTPS, the ever, how many people here know the phrase certificate authority? I see about the same number of hands. Okay, so in your browser, there are 300 companies that your browser trusts to tell you whether the website you're going to is really the one you're meant to go to. So if I type in HTTPS Facebook.com, I go somewhere, I get a little lock, I see the lock, I'm very happy, except there are 300 different companies that can make my browser produce that lock. One of them is Turkish Telecom, one of them is China Telecom, one of them is the Israeli Intelligence. So any of these companies can lie to me about whether I'm actually going to Facebook or not. That is a terrible situation, and Onion services provide one way around that. And in addition to the uh, self-authentication, you also get end-to-end -end encryption as a, a, a built-in magic bonus. So there are a bunch of cool uh, features that you get from it. So a while ago, I was talking to some law enforcement guy who was trying to bust some dude selling drugs on the internet. And I think it was called Silk Road or something like that. And he said, when we busted Silk Road, the Tor network traffic dropped in half. So it must have been that half of the Tor network was selling drugs on this website. 
And I was thinking, okay, that's that's kind of weird. I, I don't think that was happening, but I actually didn't have any data to argue with him. So then I realized I need to actually start collecting some statistics about how much of the Tor network has to do with onion services at all. So here's a graph over the past couple of years of the, the load on the Tor network that is moving bytes back and forth to and from an onion address. So it's up in the two, in the one gigabit, and uh, lately it's gone up to two gigabits. So remember, uh, before we were talking about 200 gigabits, and now we're talking about two gigabits. So this is a, a pretty small fraction, um, and it looked it looked here like it's going up. I mean, there's a clear trend of going up. But the challenge is the overall load on the Tor network is going up also. So here's the normal traffic on the Tor network going to normal websites like CNN or Facebook or whatever. Uh, and here is the onion address traffic. So this is a pretty good visualization of what fraction of the Tor network has to do with onion services at all. And that means that uh, even if every single byte having to do with onion services was Silk Road related, it's, it's a piece of this, not a piece of this. So that's you can, another way of visualizing, uh, think of it like approximately 3% of the Tor network has to do with onion services. Another piece of that is trying to figure out how many onion addresses are there at all in the world. And there are some ways that we can measure that, and here's uh, a graph over the past couple of years, and it starts around 35,000, and it goes up to 100 and something thousand. And, uh, so there are tens of thousands of onion addresses out there in the world total and compare that to the rest of the web, which has billions of web pages out there. So it's also a tiny fraction. And I talked to a bunch of companies, there are these, uh, a bunch of companies out there trying to uh, crawl the dark web, they call themselves threat, and threat intelligence companies, and they generally tell me that there are maybe 7,000 websites uh, available as onion addresses. They also I t when I talk to their technical people, they say, yeah, we have to say dark web because the marketing people want us to say that. But actually, all of our interesting information comes from our Pastebin Pro account. So they, they get an account with Pastebin, and Pastebin sends them every time uh, some jerk in Russia tries to dox some other jerk somewhere and puts it up on Pastebin. They get that information. That's where most of the interesting information comes from. It doesn't come from onion addresses at all. So that's the, the, the beginning of uh, analyzing how big the dark web is. So that means when you see a, an iceberg picture like this and somebody is trying to tell you that there are 99 other internets out there and you can only reach them over the Tor network, it's just nonsense. It's just garbage. It's just <laughs> some, news, some newspaper trying to, trying to get you to click on their ads or something. And it makes sense. I mean, a while ago, BBC did an article uh, about, I think it was Silk Road, uh, saying, you can buy drugs on the internet, and here's how. And there were a lot of really excited people. They were like, wow, thanks. I, can, I don't have to go to the street corner and get shot. This is amazing. Uh, thank you for <laughs> teaching me how to buy drugs on the internet. And then they did an article a few weeks later saying, and we bought some, and we had them tested, and they were really good. <laughs> so, what is BBC's motivation here? Are they trying to provide news? Are they trying to get you to click on their advertisements? So, whenever you see somebody trying to scare you with an iceberg, try to think through what their business model is, and also think through uh, how the statistics I was just showing you about uh, about how big the the dark web, the onion address space is. So, speaking of that, what would you think is the biggest website, the website with the most pages, available on the, the dark web? Is it some website selling something? Is it? So the answer is, it's Facebook. Facebook is the largest website on the dark web. And now you're like, oh my god, what, what, the, what, what, what does that even mean? And the answer is, Facebook wanted to give their users some more security. A few years ago, they were looking at where their users were connecting from, and they found over the course of one month, like two or three years ago, they found a million people logging into their Facebook accounts over Tor. And that 
there, a lot of them are coming from Turkey or other countries that are blocking Facebook. Makes a lot of sense. So they used that to argue internally to say, we need to set up an onion address because our users are demanding security. Let's give them security. Imagine you're a Facebook user in Turkey and you go to https facebook.com. Turkish Telecom owns a certificate authority. They can lie to you about whether you're going to Facebook. That's a terrible situation. And the Facebook security team knows that's a terrible situation. And those million people using Tor to get to Facebook know that's a terrible situation. So that's why Facebook was able to argue internally that they need to provide the security that their users are already asking for. And I was talking to one of these threat intelligence company people uh, a while ago who uh, came to me and said, I found a copy of Facebook on the dark web. And, and I, I, I was trying to explain, no, there's a website. It's called Facebook. You can get to it over HTTP. You can get to it over HTTPS. You can get to it over .onion. It's the same web server. There's no dark cloud out there. It's just computers. And you can reach them over different ways, and you get different security properties depending on how you reach them. If you, if you go to Facebook over HTTP, everybody gets to watch what you do, and they get to man the middle of you. If you go to Facebook over HTTPS, they know you're going to Facebook, and if they're pretty good at it, they can man in the middle of you. And if you go to Facebook over the onion address, nobody knows you're doing it, and they can't man in the middle of you. You get end-to-end -end encryption, you know it's Facebook, uh, and it, it requires you to have the Tor client installed, which is a, a trade-off, but if you want good security, that's the right way to reach Facebook's website. And again, it's the same computer, it's the same web server. There's no copy of Facebook off in dark cloud land. It's the same destination that you're going to over different ways. Make sense? So what are some other cool use cases for Onion services? Uh, I was talking earlier about, you know, I want to set up a website and have people be able to get there safely. Here's another interesting use case. Imagine you're a journalist and Ed Snowden just sent you a bunch of interesting documents. And you're sitting next to another journalist physically, like you're in the same room, and you want to share those documents with the other journalist. What do you do? Do you put them on Dropbox? And then <laughs> the other person fetches them from Dropbox? Probably not. Do you send them over Gmail? Probably not. Do you email them? They're probably too big, and email doesn't work that way anyway. Do you set up an FTP server? That sounds great if you know what that means, which nobody does anymore. <laughs> so, do you put them on a USB key? And, but we all know that USB keys are bad news these days. So the answer is a little tool called Onion Share, which it runs on your computer. It spins up a web server for this one file. And then it gives you this address, which you send to your friend over Signal or Jabber or Ricochet or some instant messaging service. And then they click on that in their Tor browser, they download the file, and then your website goes away, your web server goes away, and there's nothing left. So this is a, an easy way of sharing files using Tor in a totally transient way, in a totally temporary way. And so there are a lot of people using Onion Share right now uh, to move whatever their files are from one person to another. And it, it's increasingly a cool way of just having a simple website where you want to share a document with a bunch of people, and you don't want to learn how to configure Apache safely or Nginx or something like that, so you just spin up Onion Share. They've actually been working on a cool interface lately where you just drag a file into Onion Share and poof, it's serving the file over Tor, and then when it's done, it just disappears and there's nothing left. And so on, on the one hand, cool security uh, tool that a lot of people should be using. I ended up talking to a law enforcement group a little while ago about exactly this because uh, they are still in the world where there's a website with a computer and a company and you send them a legal document or something like that and that this has nothing to do with that world. There's no, there's no place to send anything. There's no middle. There's no uh, central point. Okay, so speaking of that, another cool use case for Onion services, there's a, a tool called SecureDrop, which sets up a website, and you can reach that website over Tor, 
and provide a, a leak or a whistleblowing or interact with a journalist to say, I have something that you should know about. And this allows the, the, the source to retain their own anonymity. So in a, in a normal journalist model, uh, you, t you call up the New York Times and you say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I have an important document, and that means AT&T knows about the phone call, and that means NSA knows about the phone call, and that means it's too late. Anybody watching the New York Times phone system already knows who the source is. So this is a, a, a way where the, the, the person with the information gets to stay in control of their own privacy. And it's set up right now in 75 different places, New York Times, Washington Post, a bunch of uh, high profile newspapers are using SecureDrop in order to receive interesting stories. <coughs> and one of the cool questions is, how many interesting stories are they getting? And they uh, quite reasonably don't want to answer that because it's part of the, the safety for their sources. So that's something we can talk more about uh, offline, off video. So another cool uh, example of what you can do with Onion services is Ricochet. So how many people here use Signal or WhatsApp or Jabber or Google Chat or iMessage? Your hands should be, more people should be going up as I say more things. All of these communications platforms are centralized. They all have a middle that knows who your friends are, when you're online, who you're talking to, and when you're talking to them. Even when you're using Signal, there's a central point that knows who your friends are and they know when you're online and they know who you're talking to. So the goal of Ricochet is to separate that so every user is their own Onion address. And that means that there's no middle, there's no place to go to to attack or send a legal request or break into. There's no, each, each user has their own set of addresses which are their friends and they talk to them over the Tor network so there's there, it, it's a completely decentralized chat system. And it got more interesting a year or so ago because Cloudflare decided to set up onion addresses and transparently send everybody who loads a Cloudflare page over Tor to their onion services. And they do this through a, a cool trick in the browser called alt service. So you go to a Cloudflare website and in the HTTP headers that it responds with, it says, by the way, there's an alternative address for my website, and you can go there and it'll be safer. And then the Tor browser looks at that and says, okay, I'm gonna load everything else after this from that Onion address, which means you think you're going to cloudflare.com, the browser tab says cloudflare.com, but in the background, the website told you to use the Onion address, and you're doing it, so you get end-to-end -end encryption, end-to-end -end authentication, but the experience is the same as it was before. You're going to a website, it, it just acts like, like everything is normal, you're going to cloudflare.com, but you get that extra layer of security. So I don't know what fraction of the web Cloudflare is these days, but it's, I don't know, 20%, 40%, 50%, whatever it is. So that means that 20 or 40% of the web is in the dark web now because Cloudflare did this? What does that even mean at this point? So again, it's a way of reaching a website with more security properties. It's not like a separate internet. So another way of looking at that, I've been trying to figure out how to visualize this. So this is like the, the, the newsweek.com version of what the dark web is. There's onion services, there's bad things on the internet, there's stuff Google can't reach, and it's all sort of mushed together. This is, this is the dark web. But the reality, these are all kind of separate things. There's Onion services, there are maybe 7,000 websites up right now, there's bad things on the internet, whatever that means, and there's like my Facebook private posts. I don't have any, but if I did. Uh, so these are all three separate things. Is our Onion services the dark web? And then like the bad things aren't the dark web? I don't know why, based on the fact that there aren't that many Onion services, and it's, it, it, it hasn't grown to the point that a lot of the companies are describing it that way. Or are the bad things on the internet the dark web? I think increasingly, yes. That's what uh, like discover.com does all of its threat modeling and they're like, we'll you give us money and we'll tell you if we find your company's information on the dark web. I think what they mean is 
bad things. We look at bad things and we'll call it the dark web because that makes money. Or is it stuff that Google can't find on the internet? Is that the dark web? A lot of people use that definition. And so the other key point is scale matters a lot. If the onion, this is not to scale. If it were to scale, this would not be there. It would be zero pixels. <laughs> so, in that case, which one is the dark web? Is it the bad stuff? Is it the stuff Google can't find? Is it the stuff that basically doesn't exist? So that's another way of looking at, uh, at what dark web, uh, what onion addresses, what onion services mean. So uh, there's a lot more that we can discuss about this. One of them is it's not about how many sites, it's about which ones. Maybe one bad website uh, makes everything worse, even if there are a lot of good websites. Uh, another answer is it's not about how many bytes move back and forth over onion addresses because a lot of people who are f sharing files these days put their files on Google Drive or Imgur or other places like that and then share the URLs over Tor. And uh, there are, it is true that onion services provide a way for communities, whether it's fascist, Nazis or whatever, to grow their community and feel safe. And that sucks. I don't, I, don't, I don't feel happy helping those people. OK, so there are a bunch of other things uh, that we could talk about. And the censorship circumvention one is the one we're going to cover in a little bit. Uh, and then I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk more later on about browser level safety or research or user education. And I'm going to stop here and ask for some questions and see what you all want to talk about. And there's a microphone, or not everyone in the microphone thing. You can. Great, thanks for the talk. Uh, just, well, I actually had a bunch of questions, but I, uh, I probably just asked the, uh, the smallest one. So when you were talking about the, uh, the onion share, right? So if there are two journalists that are sitting each other, uh, well, why can't I just use, you know, like SSH or SCP? Because they are basically in the same network. What's the use case, the actual use case of using Garmin Share? These journalists run Windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yep. As most people in the world do. So yes, there, if you're technical enough, you can do it on the local network. But, so the, the, the uh, significant other of one of the Intercept journalists lived in Brazil and they actually ended up sending him through London or something with documents and a little key and then he got arrested and they were trying to find a little key that's stupid yeah. so there are so many different better ways of moving documents around the world than sending a person with a little hidden thing so yes what one answer is ordinary people don't know what SCP is and the other answer is a lot of situations you end up not sitting next to each other and you want to be able to share things safe. Sure, thank you. Should we get a second microphone? Is that possible? Uh, is, uh, how do you measure the traffic uh, on Toro Network? Yes, great. So the, the question is how do we measure, how do I have all these graphs? How do I have uh, an understanding of what's going on in the Tor network. So the answer is, each Tor relay gets to see how much traffic it's handling. It doesn't know both who the user is and where the destination is, but the first relay in the, in the circuit knows where the user is, just doesn't know what they're doing. And the last relay in the circuit knows that somebody's going to WikiLeaks, but it doesn't know who is going there. So each of these relays publishes a, a, a a, 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 a summary of what bandwidth it's seen over the past day and what countries it's seen people connecting to over the past day. And that gets published in public in our data set. And that means that everybody can look at it and produce their own statistics and their own graphs about it. And part of our goal is we don't want to, we don't want to collect anything that we aren't willing to publish. So all the stuff that, that these graphs come from it is all that data is public and you can look at it too. If you find things that are too scary, please let us know. 
I think we've got the right balance right now between not knowing what's going on and having some idea so that we can follow along and make graphs. Did that make sense? We have a second microphone. Your second microphone is a little bit weird. Awesome. I'm going to give this to you and I'll use this one for now. <laughs> Question is, uh, what if there are more and more corrupt relays and uh, infiltrate the whole TOR network, and even they become a majority? And uh, how can we prevent or against this kind of attack? Uh, because the IoT network and I, uh, IPv6 are all coming, and the uh, relays are more and more uh, not in our control. We, well, we even don't know if we can trust it. So how can we get this kind of majority attack? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one of the answers is we need to know the people who run the relays. And we don't have to know every one of them, but so there are a lot of very big relays out there, and there are a lot of very small relays out there. And it's really important for us to know the big ones, or at least most of them. It doesn't have to be all of them. Uh, part of the, the goal of Tor is it should not be the case that the first relay you use is bad and also the last relay you use is bad. So it's a, it's a math, it's a probability game. And that means that if we can keep most of the Tor network honest, then that, that's good enough. So the, the first question is how do we make sure that we know enough of the relays? And I know a lot of the relay operators right now, so it's, it's, we're doing okay, I think. But, uh, but we, this is definitely a thing that we need to think more about and we need better research on. But it's worse than that, because even if somebody here is honest and they set up a relay and it's great, and they put the relay somewhere where the network attacker is already watching that network. Like, let's say I put one up in, in the US and AT&T is already watching that, so the NSA is already watching that. It's a good relay. I'm, I'm an honest relay operator, but the attacker still gets to see the traffic going back and forth through that relay. So it's, 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 the first question is, how do you know you trust the relays? But that's not enough. The second question is, the internet is way too centralized. There are not very many cables that go across the Atlantic, and not very many cables that go across the Pacific. And there are a bunch of different intelligence agencies that are working hard to be able to watch those cables. So we used to make gestures like this, you bounce around the internet, but maybe you bounce back and forth over something that level three gets to watch. So that, that's part of what I meant uh, towards the beginning about measuring the safety of Tor. It's about diversity of where the relays are relative to who gets to watch them. And we need a, we need a less centralized internet in order to be able to, to make a better Tor system. Can I have a follow-up? Yes. <laughs> uh, in my understanding that your answer basically tells us that uh, between uh, fully decentralized and uh, completely centralized. Uh, we cannot reach both sides, but we can reach some side, uh, some point that we have some uh, even more trust uh, uh, relays that help us. That so, okay, maybe some of my points are not trustworthy, but I can make sure that some points are. So somehow the the, route, the whole routing is still okay. Uh, but uh, somehow uh, there's a suggestion that. that uh, if that's the model you are proposing, that probably for the users, maybe we can provide them that, uh, some kind of risk, risk index to tell them that, okay, uh, your, 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 your browsing is, uh, have some kind of risk index, and it's calculated by some kind of how many trust relays already know, and uh, how many untrust relays uh, we go through. So maybe, for example, if, if it is 50%, it means that at least 50% of the nodes are, are guaranteed by the TR project that like this is trustworthy. So the users can know, okay, if, uh, if my area, the index is too high, probably, okay, if I can use the TR service, but I still need to know that maybe all the spice relays are around me, and uh, it's, it's useless for me to use this TR service right now and here. I'd love to do that if I knew how to. I don't know how to judge safety of every relay out there in a way that's accurate, and everybody's threat model is different. Maybe I'm worried about French intelligence and you're not worried about French intelligence. And it's about where the users are. If you're using Tor from Shanghai, 
you might worry about somebody watching your local network in a way that has nothing to do with where the relays are. So it gets complicated very quickly. I'd, I'm, I, I'd be worried about claiming something that make users feel like they understand what's going on, and I'd be wrong. So yes, I'd like to do something like that, but I don't know how to. It's just a suggestion, thank you. Yeah, do you have any policy on restricting tour relays being set up in certain countries based on the political situation? So you say, okay, we won't have an exit node in China because the government will watch it, but we would have an exit node in Iceland or something like that. Mostly, no. You can't run relays in China right now because China blocks the directory authorities, so your relays can't advertise themselves. Nobody knows that there are relays in China. But that's a censorship thing that China did not something we did. I, uh, there is, I think, a rule right now where you can't run an exit relay in Syria and Iran. And the reason for that is not that we have opinions about those countries. It's that there were a lot of people a few years ago running tour and adding themselves as a relay and saying, this is cool, I'm going to help out. And I don't think they really understood what they were doing. So I, to help them, we figured the best thing to do was to not add those relays into the network. But it was a it was a small number of people, and they were tiny relays, so it was an easy decision to make. Yeah. And if, if you came to me and said, there's something terrible happening in, in France right now, but France is running 10% of the tour network, then we'd have a more of a balance to try to make. But yeah, for the most part, we allow all the relays in by country. Can I ask a follow-up? Did there used to be tour relays, relays in China in the past, like say 10 years ago? What yes. has changed since then? Was it just because they started blocking all the bridges? Uh, they, China blocks the tour directory authorities, mm. which means the relays, when they publish their existence, that gets blocked. When the, when the relays in China try to reach the, the rest of the tour network, those connections get blocked. And that means we have no idea how many relays are thinking they're running in China right now and failing to tell anybody. But yes, there were plenty of large relays in China 11 years ago. And that sort of ties into the next uh, discussion on censorship. We could also we could take a short break while people install Tor browser and get a drink and so on, uh, and then start up again. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll start up in three or four minutes or something. Everybody can look at the social media. 